Hey y'all, Miss Mayhew here, and we are going to go over part two of the chapter seven notes. So in the last video, we already have gone over 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3 that talk about the different modes of cell reproduction, um, the genetically identical cells that are produced in binary fission and mitosis, and how cell reproduction and the cell cycle is under that precise control through the use of those CDKs and cyclins. In this video, we're gonna be talking about meiosis, which is going to be what halves the nuclear chromosome content and generates diversity. Um, and we're also gonna talk about programmed cell death being a necessary process in living organisms and why. Now, as cells go through the cell cycle um, and then mature, programmed cell death is a necessary um, process that is going to happen to these older cells. So apoptosis is a genetically programmed cell death. And there's two possible reasons that this would happen. The first is that the cell is no longer needed. Okay, so that might be that the connective tissue between the fingers of a fetus. So as, um, as you know, your fingers are not webbed, okay? But fetuses, their fingers are webbed. So over time, like those cells are going to go through apoptosis because we don't need webbed fingers outside of the womb. We don't live in a liquid environment anymore, okay? Also, old cells that are prone to genetic damage um, that can occur through just like errors in copying or environmental factors. Those damages could lead to cancer. This is especially true of epithelial cells um, that are on the surface and more exposed to things. And they die after days or even weeks. Now this program cell death doesn't happen randomly. It's a very controlled process that is controlled by signals. There are internal signals that might be linked to cell age or damaged DNA. So as a cell ages, it activates a signal, or if the DNA is damaged, that activates a signal. Both internal and external signals lead to the activation of caspases. Okay, these are uh, proteins and enzymes which hydrolyze target proteins in a cascade of events. So it kind of starts this waterfall of events and reactions that is going to cause this apoptosis. This cell death happens as the caspases hydrolyze proteins of the nuclear envelope, nucleosomes, and cell membrane essentially causing the cell to burst. So I'm gonna just start off by talking about what happens when the cell cycle can't be controlled or isn't controlled. Okay, when that happens, this is what forms cancer cells. Cancer cells do not respond normally to the body's control mechanisms. Um, so essentially, they are going to continue to divide regardless of what is controlling the cell cycle or telling the cell cycle it shouldn't. Okay, when this happens, it forms tumors. Um, tumors can be benign or malignant. If they're benign, that means that they're not harmful. Okay, if they're malignant, that is where they're invasive. Tumors are just um, clumps of cells that have grown abnormally. Now, like I said, those malignant tumors are tumors that invade surrounding tissues, okay? Once this happens, they can also metastasize, okay? When um, a cancer metastasizes, that means that cancer cells are transported to other parts of the bodies where they may form secondary tumors. So in this diagram here at the bottom left, you can see the initial start of the growth of the tumor. Okay, so at this point, the tumor is benign. It's not invading any other surrounding or neighboring tissues. It's remaining in that same spot. It's not like crossing any boundaries. 
The second picture, though, you can see that that tumor is starting to invade um, that, gr that glandular tissue um, to the side of it. So it's now crossed that boundary and it's gotten to start invading those. So at this point, it is malignant. Okay, the third picture, you can see that now there are blood vessels and lymph vessels that are running through um, that tissue. And if one of those cancer cells breaks off and is transported through either of those vessels, it can stop and form a new tumor elsewhere. Okay, so on this picture, um, you can see on the fourth side that there is a metastatic tumor, meaning it's transported and started in a new place. Now I want to talk a little bit about how meiosis is different than mitosis. Okay, so meiosis is going to half the nuclear chromosome content. It's going to give you half of the genetic information in the daughter cells than was in the parent cell. Okay, when this happens, there's something important that generates diversity. Okay, that is something called independent assortment. Independent assortment only happens in meiosis, and it happens specifically at anaphase 1, which is the first time that the chromosomes are split apart. Okay, independent assortment means that there is a matter of chance, of randomness, as to which member of a homologous pair goes to which daughter cell. So whether it's the homologous pair from your mom or the homologous pair from your dad, there's a random chance as they line up in metaphase, which one is going to which side. It's not like all of your moms line up on the left and all of your dads line up on the right. They line up randomly. Now, the greater the number of chromosomes, the greater the potential for gen genetic diversity meaning the more chromosomes you have, the more combinations that there can be whenever they're split. Okay, in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So if you do two to the 23rd, meaning there are two chances for each of those 23, that gives us 8,388,608 different combinations of maternal and paternal chromosomes that can be produced. This is essentially why not all sibling sets are twins. Each gamete has a different combination of those homologous pairs. This diagram shows you the two different options that can happen in, let's say, there's only two sets of chromosomes. So on the left side, that would be all of the mothers lining up on the left and all of the fathers lining up on the right. If that's the case, then you would end up with um, one of the daughter cells in telophase one with all the mothers and one with all the fathers. Or one of them could line up on the opposite side and you could get one from the mom and one from the dad and one from the mom and one from the dad. Now, as you add more chromosomes, then those numbers of combinations increases because in the second division, that is going to split those chromosomes in half again. So this is one cause of genetic diversity that occurs in um, the formation of gametes. So in the two divisions of meiosis, this is com a very complex process and there are errors that can occur. One of the errors that is talked about the most is non-disjunction. Non-disjunction is the failure of chromosomes or chromatids to separate properly. And there's two different places in this can occur, anaphase 1 and anaphase 2. In anaphase 1, the chromosomes are lined up as homologous pairs, and they separate or should separate one homologous pair to one daughter cell and one homologous pair to another daughter cell. Sometimes these homologous pairs fail to separate and they stay together when they're pulled to one of the daughter cells. The same concept could occur when sister chromatids fail to separate at anaphase 2. In metaphase 2, the chromosomes are lined up in the middle and in anaphase 2, each of the sister chromatids should go to one daughter cell or the other. 
Sometimes, though, these sister chromatids stay together and end up going to um, one of the daughter cells together. Both of these are going to result in aneuploidy. This is an abnormal number of chromosomes, so either too many or not enough. So this aneuploidy can occur whenever a normal gamete is fused with an abnormal gamete. So either one with an extra chromosome or one with a missing chromosome. When this happens, you either are going to have zygotes that are missing one of the chromosomes or a zygote that has an additional chromosome. If the zygote has an extra one, we call that a trisomy. And if they're missing one, we call that a monosomy. Each of these should have two. Remember, one from mom and one from dad. If they get two from one parent and one from the other, they end up with three, so we call it a trisomy. If they only get one from one parent and none from the other, they only have one, and we call it a monosomy. Karyotypes originally were used to identify and classify organisms because not all organisms have the same number of chromosome sets. For example, we have 23 pairs, but mosquitoes have three pairs. Um, but nowadays we use DNA sequencing in order to compare different organisms because we now have the ability to get more information than just the sheer number of chromosomes. We can see the differences now that we're able to do that. Now what we use karyotyping for is to identify chromosome abnormalities. Karyotypes are pictures of condensed chromosomes for a given organism where they're distinguished by their sizes and centromere positions. So they organize all of the pictures um, or all of the chromosomes in size order and are able to look at it from there. When they look at that, they're expecting to see two chromosomes for each set. If you see three or you see one, we can use that to identify a trisomy or a monosomy. Most human embryos um, from aneuploidy zygotes do not survive. Many miscarriages are due to this. Um, there's either too much genetic information or not enough for that zygote to survive. The most common human aneuploidy is trisomy 16. Trisomy 21 is one that you've probably heard of. This causes Down syndrome, and it's one of the few aneuploidies that actually allows a zygote to survive. 